Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Havens Wright Center Fall 2022 Lecture Series. My name is Adrienne Padgett, and I will be facilitating the event today. Today's talk is Engaging Human Rights to Organize for Reproductive Justice by Zakia Luna of Washington University in St. Louis. This event is co-sponsored by the Center for Research on Gender and Women here at the UW-Madison. We're thrilled to have Zakia join us today for what promises to be an excellent presentation and discussion. But before I introduce Professor Luna, I'd like to go over a quick few logistical matters. First, she will speak for about 35 to 40 minutes which will leave us about 40 to 45 minutes for discussion and Q&A. We will try and conclude by 1.30 p.m. U.S. Central Time, just under 90 minutes from now. The meeting today is being recorded and the video will be posted to the Havens Wright Center YouTube channel and website sometime in the coming weeks. I'd also like to let you know about some upcoming events here at the Havens Wright Center. On Thursday, November 3rd at 12 noon U.S. Central, 6 p.m. London time, Noam Chomsky will join us for his talk, The Final Question, Global Realignments and Prospects for a Livable World. And on Tuesday, November 8th at 12 noon U.S. Central time, 6 p.m. London time, we will welcome Roberto Mangabera Unger for his talk, Is There an Alternative? For details on those talks, including how to register, please check out the Havens Wright Center website. Now to today's event. Zakia Luna is Associate Professor of Sociology and Dean's Distinguished Professorial Scholar at Washington University in St. Louis. Her research, teaching, and community work focus on social movements, reproduction, human rights, and intersectionality. In addition to her first book entitled Reproductive Rights as Human Rights, Women of Color and the Fight for Reproductive Justice. She is co-editor of Black Feminist Sociology, Perspectives and Praxis with Whitney Laster Pirtle. Her work can also be found in spaces ranging from the scholarly to the popular and such journals as Mobilization, Gender and Society and Feminist Studies on the one hand to Ms. Magazine and Refinery29 on the other. Professor Luna currently serves as principal investigator of the Mobilizing Millions Project, in which a team of researchers are examining the dynamics of the January 21st, 2017 women's marches worldwide. She holds a joint PhD in sociology and women's studies from the University of Michigan, where she also earned a master's of social work. And prior to her faculty positions at Wash U and the University of California, Santa Barbara, Luna was awarded innumerable prestigious postdocs, including the Mellon Sawyer Seminar Human Rights Postdoc here at UW-Madison. On her website, Luna shares that her life has been driven internally and externally by the desire, quote, to help change the world, otherwise what's the point, end quote. And the Havens Wright Center could not agree more. We are delighted to have her join us today. Professor Luna. Hi. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, um, Adrian. And I also want to thank um, the staff um, like Jaina and Peter, who have helped put this together. And of course, the audience as well. I know that um, people can get so zoomed out <laughs> as we enter the third year of the ongoing pandemic. <laughs> but um, it does allow for some exchange of ideas um, across the state and really across the world um, based on the registration list here. Um, and also um, I'm right now in St. Louis, so that is the land of many people, including the Osage people. So I want to give thanks um, to their continual stewardship of this land. Alrighty, so I am going to do some slides and it's nice to see so many new faces and some familiar faces. My plan is to talk about my work around um, reproductive justice specifically, and then, oops, um, sorry about that, um, then maybe get into a little bit of newer research that continues to look at sort of where the reproductive justice movement has gone. I uh, always like to make sure to start out really defining what reproductive justice is and 
because I never know who's coming into the Zoom room. Some of you may have noticed the news uh, regarding the Carter Genius um, Award winners, and it actually happens that Loretta Ross, who was a national coordinator and a sort of um, foremother of the reproductive justice movement, was awarded one for her work around reproductive justice. So, um, but uh, the concept itself was developed in 1994 by a group of Black women who were at a conference, uh, actually over in Illinois, um, semi close to me, a quote unquote pro choice conference um, that was focusing on abortion rights. And reproductive justice was really a way for them to designate thinking about reproductive rights in the context of social justice. Sister Song, um, is I'd say the organization and coalition sort of most associated with reproductive justice. If you were to type in reproductive justice um, right now, even before the MacArthur Award that Loretta Ross got, uh, first or second thing that would have come up was Sister Song. And so they expanded the definition to talk broadly about the right to not have children, like what we see with um, advocacy around birth control, advocacy about abortion rights but also really thinking about the rights to have children and the rights to parent children uh, that we have uh, based on the really different histories, uh, which I'll talk about, um, that communities of color and poor white communities have experienced historically within the US and really beyond. And what is, well, I'll focus on Sister Song. I also will talk more broadly and you'll see some images that are broader than Sister Song. And at its peak uh, in 2005, there were about 80 member and allied organizations, and they had individual members. And I was just at a Sister Song conference um, in August in Dallas, Texas, and things are still going strong. Um, something that really intrigued me as someone who's doing work on social movements, uh, where a lot of the emphasis um, in US social movements was on civil rights and civil rights framings, I noticed, you know, Sister Song was really talking about human rights um, and not just in a passing way and really had this mission to amplify and strengthen the collective voices of indigenous women and women of color to ensure reproductive justice through securing human rights. But for me, I was like, well, what does that really mean, right? To talk about human rights, you hear in all sorts of spaces and places and movements and rallies and chants. And why human rights really? And I think part of you know, the answer, right, is human rights really allows for this much broader visioning of not just what people are fighting against, but also what they're fighting for. And this definition coming from Asian communities for reproductive justice really encompasses that, right? Like the social, political, and economic power and resources to make healthy decisions about our gender, bodies, and sexualities for ourselves, our families, and communities really does um, get at that expansiveness, right? So it's both really simple, but also uh, quite complex when you think about it, right? Because they're calling in basically like most structures. And just to emphasize the sort of context, um, on one hand, right, the US government, and many people in the US think of the US as a space that has historically had human rights, especially compared to all those other countries out there and over there. Um, there's research coming from political science and others that really talk about this exceptionalism like Michael Ignacia and um, Sally Mary, and many others, right? And I do think it's important um, to point out that while the US government was certainly involved, right, with the creation of the United Nations and the formation of the Universal De Declaration of Human Rights, the way the US government has really conceptualized human rights has been pretty limited, right, to civil and political rights. Um, and to the dismissal of broader social and economic rights. The, this is just a screenshot of what you'll find right now under the current president. And in many ways, it's actually not unusual um, for the US government, irrespective of which um, administration was in power, right? The sort of ambivalent, as Chris Roberts calls it, relationship um, with human rights, right? And, really a lot of times the US government is connecting human rights to democracy promotion abroad, right? And freedoms abroad that need to be um, given to others, right? Rather than really taking an inward look, right? And the US government isn't the only country that um, 
engages in a practice of emphasizing how people outside the nation should be using that particular version of human rights. But uh, this is the context in which movements have been engaging, right? So it seemed a little unusual to try to focus on international human rights uh, when it was very much, um, at least from governmental perspective, more of something you'd see outside. And so part of the answer, you know, just step back a little bit into um, what I think of as the not so distant past into the histories, right? Particularly the reproductive histories that really different communities of color um, have been contending with in the US context, right? Um, we can go to slavery, right? And look at how um, Dr. Marion Sims right, made, you know, major advances around gynecology, but through the use of his, you know, slaves, right? Who didn't have really a choice in the matter, right? And he's been heralded and lauded and you know, given statues, which have, have recently, you know, been in various places um, contested. But when we think about, you know, this, right, being part of the early reproductive history of Black women in particular, right, or um, uh, for Native people, um, just people on decimation, right, of families, right? So the reproductive experience, right, involves not even being able to say, right, whether or not you wanted a doctor to operate on you, right, or also not having um, the ability, right, to keep your families together, right? Since under slavery, slave masters got to decide what happened to their quote unquote property, right? So this already sets things in a different sort of reproductive experience. And as does just the long history of eugenics within the US and um, imagine, you know, many people in this room might be familiar, but I think it's important to keep in mind, right? That this wasn't some fringe ideology, right? This um, was, um, you know, this ideology was really supported by the quote unquote, most advanced scientists, right? Um, and, you know, university presidents, legislators, Supreme Court judges, right? Who really you know, wanted to use the ideas coming from Darwin about species development and apply to humans, right? And did that through encouraging um, certain families and communities to reproduce and really discouraging the reproduction of other groups, right? And as it happened, right? Racial minorities, um, people with disabilities, right? Immigrants of a range, right? Were targeted, right? And um, Alex Stern really talks about, right? How that's developed this sort of eugenic nation all under this narrative of public health, right? So we have this ongoing experience of reproductive control, quote unquote, for the health of the nation, right? And I always like to point out, um, you know, in this uh, eugenics image, right, how many different disciplines are in there, right? Certainly we have genetics and um, we have history, but we also have sociology in there, right? Um, we also have um, statistics in there, right? It was all kind of pulling together. And while it sort of formally fell out of favor, particularly after World War II and the specter of Nazi Germany, this sort of thinking about who's fit to reproduce and who isn't continues in many ways, right? And we can see it in contemporary policies. At the same time, right, there have been major advances around reproductive autonomy, like the legalization of contraception, um, which as we know, still remains contested. Um, but you know, six, 1968, we have Griswold v. Connecticut, which makes it you know, legal federally for married couples to access uh, birth control. And then 1972, right, Eisenstadt v. Baird, which uh, applies to single people, right? So that meant people could access it without fear of um, arrest. <laughs> and um, you know, then there was this sort of booming markets around providing um, additional types of contraception, like oral contraception, which there are some great books out there, uh, whether by Linda Gordon or um, my friend Crystal Littlejohn just published Just Get on the Pill um, to understand more of those histories. But it all kind of comes together. And then we have the Roe decision, right, 1973. And these are the common images, right, photos of Supreme Court taken decades apart um, and could have added one for Dobbs, right? Um, just the continuing images being around that abortion being the primary reproductive issue. And again, well, certainly is the case um, for some, right, that accessing abortion and was a primary concern for others, right? It was abortion as well as being able to not have to experience, you know, forced sterilization, right? Not having to experience uh, punitive welfare policies if um, like welfare family caps, 
if someone was on welfare and wanted to have more children. And so then we see this shift, right? The really centering of women of color and reproductive activism, or rather the attempts by women of color to move to the center that, you know, you can look back even, you know, in the sixties and see the work that was happening that women of color were engaged in, yes, around abortion advocacy, as well as opposing forced sterilization. And they were doing this work both on their own, in their own sort of racial communities, as well as with allied radical, like socialist white women, right? So we saw some coalition um, early on, and but the Roe decision really mobilized, right, the anti-abortion movement, um, which was quite nascent at that time. And Kristen Luker and um, Mary Ziegler have, and Sarah Matheson have written uh, wonderfully about um, the sort of complexity of the alliances leading up to that, as well as um, the narrowing, right, of reproductive concerns to basically saving Roe, right, in a particular way, even as we had the Hyde Amendment happening. So I, you know, I'm toggling back and forth in part to show you, right, that while the common narrative is that abortion has been the primary concern around which reproductive issues have been engaged with. We have this long history of communities of color, right, challenging the ways in which they weren't being allowed to have children, in which they weren't being allowed to raise their families, right, simultaneously. And really, at times, also framing this as an issue of human rights. Um, if you look to way back, right, there's things around um, how this um, forced sterilization is genocide, right? and hearkening back to say, Nazi Germany. And so we have this through line, but something, you know, again, abortion really taking up um, a lot of the space and yet communities of color, right? Really feeling the impact of abortion restrictions. And I always like to point out, you know, the first major abortion restriction was actually like in 1976 with the Hyde Amendment, which if, um, which restricted federal funding for abortion, right? Henry Hyde, um, was anti-abortion was really clear, right? That the long-term goal was to make abortion illegal for everybody, but at the time, the only vehicle available was the Medicaid bill, right? So um, poor, poor people would have to be the place to start, essentially, for this much longer vision. And, you know, then we started seeing, again, this patchwork, right? In which Medicaid recipients, depending upon the state they were in, might be able to access abortion beyond these federally mandated situations, but it was very, very dependent, right? So we were already going back to a time as we saw pre-Roe in which really there was this patchwork of your, your geography and your, your state location making such a big difference. And to put some things in context, I also like to remind folks that um, the Hyde Amendment was a budget writer, right? That's renewed each year uh, by politicians of a range of um, political, leanings, um, including those who had been endorsed by sort of mainstream reproductive rights organizations. And folks like Naya Mark Theory and others have written more about sort of how it was that reproductive rights organizations were making these decisions. And there's some strategic decisions around, you know, not doing more to try to oppose Hyde, at least publicly, but each year, uh, Medicaid recipients who are disproportionately uh, people of color, right, uh, we're feeling the impacts of abortion restrictions. So both fighting this type of um, you know, um, control, uh, the reproductive control, as well as still dealing with issues of forced sterilization and issues of dealing with um, child and family services, right? Just the range and ways of reproduction was being surveyed in which, you know, this choice ideology, this choice language that made it, you know, pro-choice or, you know, um, anti-choice, really didn't summarize it, right? Because there were so few choices available, um, particularly to folks of color. And we really saw this rise of these reproductive justice organizations in the 90s. Um, and some of them uh, have shifted their names, but in all the ones on here um, continue to exist um, and continue to be doing work at both state level and national level. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the shift though, right? Because it used to be that it was much more sort of marginal, right? Um, reproductive justice activism. And now you have legislators, right? Um, saying it um, uh, and tweeting it. And you also saw the explicit linking of different movements, which was, you know, there from the beginning, but also um, even in more contemporary protests, right? Like Black Lives Matter protests, right? 
Um, you saw coalition efforts between like Trust Black Women Coalition, which had been working around abortion access in Black women in solidarity with Black Lives Matter, right? And the continual, right, ways in which they're sort of seeking coalition and saying like, you know, yes, choices matter, but the context in which people are making choices is really the big factor, right? And that we really need to focus on, you know, achieving human rights um, to be able to all, you know, flourish um, in our reproductive possibilities and hopes. Um, this is an example of how Sister Song, um, in particular as a coalition, which included all those organizations and those other slides, right, uh, was doing this work of engaging with human rights. Um, here was something from their newsletter, uh, Reproductive Rights or Human Rights, right? And this particular piece right, goes through right, parts of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which um, the vast majority of people in the US um, have not come across, actually. <laughs> um, Opportunity Agenda did some research about 10 years ago and right about 10% of people could name. Um, and I imagine if I ask you right now um, to name um, the eight categories or you know four articles, like people would probably struggle a little in comparison to like the Bill of Rights, right? It's not something that's really taught as much in the US in public education in particular, right? Compared to when um, people that I interviewed who were from Europe or Latin America, who, for whom it was part of their social science education. Right? So in my research, I looked at like documents and interviews and what's going on in different spaces. And just a couple examples are coming out from this newsletter, right? It is doing this work of translating, right? And what I talk about, um, uh, whereas, you know, the US government was engaged in restrictive domestication of human rights, really trying to restrict the meaning and make it much smaller. Um, Sister Song was a space that was engaged in revolutionary domestication, right? Doing this domesticating work in the sense of trying to talk about human rights as relevant to the domestic sphere, but really for some purposes that would require major structural change, which would be quite revolutionary. Right? So here um, they're talking about population control as a human rights violation, right? Uh, or doing this sort of practice that we see in international human rights around sort of naming and shaming and trying to, you know, educate the readers of this newsletter who would have been members um, as well as people who might pick it up at different conferences and stuff, right? And talk about how the U.S. was really sort of, you know, out of compliance with the rest of the industrialized world, right? For not having at that time signed CEDAW, for example, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination of Women Against Women. And so there's this, you know, constant work of educating even supporters about sort of the expansiveness of human rights so that they could then be better sort of um, organizers, right, for human rights. And yet, right, it, the fact is, right, they're still engaging in a U.S. context. And, you know, one of the people I interviewed, right, um, and I'm happy to talk more in the Q&A about sort of how I um, uh, differentiate between the sort of views around human rights. You know, there were some folks, for example, Loretta Ross and a few others, right, who were really like, true believers, right, and really, um, you know, engaged with international human rights events and domestic, you know, advocacy work and really trying to create a domestic human rights movement. There were various folks who were unsure in the middle. And then there are also various skeptics, right? And there's someone, you know, like Karen, who was working in policy advocacy with a national reproductive health organization, who said, you know, you know, when thinking about how you're actually talking to legislators, um, you know, we're really in a pragmatist environment politically. So whatever works. Right? And so it's kind of a know your audience. And then she goes on to say, so if we're talking to a very liberal member who's super, super lefty and all of that, and you want to talk puppies and rainbows and human rights, and whatever, you know, and then she sort of stopped herself and was like, wow, it's, it's really sad that human rights is puppies and rainbows said, but, you know, we're having to think in much more practical terms, right? What do you do when you're trying to get votes from legislators specifically, right? When you're not engaged in the grassroots activism of organizing communities anymore, and you're trying to move to the policy level. And she talked about how sometimes that know your audience was really around having to make an economic argument for why you might need um, birth control, why you might need to support um, reproductive health care, and she said, you know, and, and that's really iffy territory, right? Because 
that does move us much closer, right, to some eugenic arguments about why legislators should be supporting this rather than, you know, a broader human rights, right? And, um, you know, that was in 2009. And, um, well, there's been some shifts. Uh, the fact is, right, when people are doing specific, you know, legislative advocacy, they really do have to think about what will that legislator think of as realistic, right? Whereas quite a bit about human rights is in some ways imagining what we have yet to not experience, right? What we haven't yet seen, um, whether that be full labor rights, whether that be full um, health care. And, you know, many countries have seen versions of certain things, right? But all together in one place, right? That's actually quite revolutionary to imagine. And some would say utopian and some historians have you know, talked about human rights as utopian, but I think that reproductive justice in particular is a space where, um, and you see this at the convenings, where they try to make the utopic real, right? Um, I'm happy to talk about that more. Uh, and you know, over the decades, reproductive justice uh, organizations and initiatives have continued to thrive, and there's been sort of concerted efforts um, to do more education not just to other sort of sectors of the reproductive movements, but to the public, right? And social media has helped shift some of that sort of space. And, and really, um, you can now see um, people from various, you know, initiatives identified, you know, as reproductive justice initiatives explicitly being quoted, right, um, as experts around these issues. And these are just some examples. Um, you also see the shifting of various organizations that were working from a reproductive justice framework, but had yet to fully claim that space, you know, going through some internal um, discussions and making those changes, like the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health, which a few years ago shifted to the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice, right? And they've been involved with many coalitions for quite a while, right? Uh, as well as, you know, the increasing sets of constituency networks like Constellation, which really focuses on Black um, reproductive health and rights justice activists coming together right? and pr to produce a radical vision. And while people may be coming from different sort of movement sectors within the space, the emphasis is on reproductive justice. And um, to me, that's not a surprise because the founder, uh, Paris Hatcher, was one of my interviewees, right? Um, uh, who at the time, had been working at Spark Reproductive Justice, right? And really thinking about bodily autonomy and sort of what would be the next steps, right? And had the foresight to think about um, creating this type of space. And you see development of these sorts of networks. Um, and you've also seen increasing visibility even in, um, you know, reproductive justice and, and I'm happy to talk more about this as well. Um, going from being um, more marginal to being rather mainstream, some of which uh, was supported by various reproductive justice activists who've been involved in activism for decades, and some of which really raised concerns about co-optation, um, which was already coming up in my interviews and has um, continued to come up. Uh, but we saw folks like Sister Song getting invited to the White House under the Obama administration. And then more recently, right, we've seen reproductive justice being named, right? So there's been meetings, um, for example, one in May, 2022, that involved various uh, leaders of reproductive justice organizations um, and, and coalitions like Sister Song, right? Like NAPOF, National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum, um, as well as another in, in June after, you know, Supreme Court briefing. And then as recently as September, and some of these things are televised, some of them are behind closed doors, but this also like so a shift, right? And with all within this context, right, that um, these advocates make a point to talk about how even when they're talking about abortion, it's not only about abortion, right? It's not only about birth control and protecting not having children. It's also about parenting and the broader needs for health care. Um, and I'm going to show just a couple more slides. Um, give you a preview of a little bit of research I've been working on, literally working on an article, right, um, around what's been happening in the reproductive justice movement. And, you know, very recently, um, like 
last year, <laughs> multiple coalitions put together policy agendas, right? Uh, with some of the familiar names of organizations. And these agendas ranged um, from um, like the, the youth agenda was about 25 pages and involved one of the larger um, youth networks that organizes throughout the Midwest and East and some West Coast all the way to the Black Reproductive Justice Policy Agenda, which was about 75 pages, right? And so ostensibly with titles like this, um, and there was a Native one, a Latino one as well, um, and the uh, Asian and Asian American Pacific Islander one, right? So ostensibly, um, you know, we know that the timing of these, right, uh, there were abortion restrictions have been increasing, increasing um, in the beginning of the pandemic. We saw various states, including like Texas, just halt abortion procedures, right? So these folks understand the stakes around abortion and also say like, but that's not the only issue, right? And in fact, we need to think much more broadly about, again, that broader context um, around economic issues, around uh, criminalization, around immigration issues. And um, I'm just gonna show you very quickly a table in which I've been doing analysis of some of this. And, you know, showing in these agendas, right, like what the top issues were. And the color coding just goes with, um, uh, so that you can track the issue across the different agendas. And um, only in one of them was abortion the primary issue. And in fact, you see uh, proportionally the primary issue. Um, and in fact, you see um, healthcare, actually just general healthcare, right, topping the set of priorities um, and a couple of them. And healthcare really being there, um, in the top five, right, for all of them. And also issues of race being highly present and issues of economics being um, present as well. And then broader concerns around sexuality, right? And to me, this is important to think about, right, this context in which um, these are folks, uh, many of them and the organizations that were involved with producing these, which included Sister Song for the Black Reproductive Justice Agenda, and various founding organizations of Sister Song um, broader coalition, right? We're all involved with producing you know, these agendas. And even with the stakes so high, right? This understanding of the necessity, right? Of thinking about the realities for many communities of color um, who are disproportionately low income. And then for youth, right? Um, who are formally disenfranchised from formal legislative processes right, thinking about, right, what it means, right, to have, to achieve reproductive justice, right, and for them, right, this economic issues being important, it, addressing issues of immigration, addressing issues of race, like, all being necessary parts of the puzzle, right, and part of the sort of broader organizing strategies, and even, um, as I mentioned, you know, I was just at a conference back in August, and even back in that conference, um, which was taking place in Texas, right? Uh, Dobbs had not yet come down, man, still in effect. And there are many people, yes, working around abortion care specifically. They're also working around trans rights, environmental justice, um, general health care access, reproductive technology access, right? Um, and that over time, the need hasn't grown smaller to think about these issues. It's actually grown that greater, right? As we've seen a disillusion of state supports. And so this like broader human rights, right, being uh, necessary and part of the organizing strategy. So I think that's an interesting sort of trend um, that I, of course, will keep observing. And I'm happy to answer questions about um, what this all means. Um, the reproductive justice movement has continued to sort of gain in its strength, as well as um, not just you know, by numbers, but also by visibility, by these traditional markers and um, uh, representation within media as uh, having an important critical way to understand the reproductive realities that quite frankly, most people are experiencing, right? Um, not just around rights to not have children, but also around the rights to have children and the rights to parent. Um, if you wanna learn more courses Q&A, you can find my book on NYU and all of that. And um, I wanna thank you all. If we don't end up getting to your questions, feel free to email me. I'm gonna end things there. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sakia. That was really great. Um, a great place for us to begin the Q&A, which we will start now. I'm going to take questions in groups of three. And there are two ways you can ask a question. First, you can raise your hand virtually 
um, by going to the bottom of your Zoom window. To do that, all you need to do is click on the reactions button and see the raise hand functionality, and I will call on your name. Alternatively, you can type your question into the chat and I will read it out for you. If you do opt to ask your question yourself, uh, please turn on your camera so uh, you can have an actual interaction uh, with uh, Professor Luna as well as with the rest of us as the audience. So, any takers? Yeah, I will ask one question um, while we wait for others um, to contemplate their own, but I was hoping you could say more about why Loretta, Ro Loretta Ross and Sister Song or perhaps other activists in that um, in that space chose to pivot from or away uh, away from the privacy argument, uh, which I feel as though uh, is ser it serves as the ground uh, the groundwork or the basis for um, the argument for reproductive justice, um, at least in terms of the abortion component um, towards uh, a human rights uh, argument. I would love to hear more about that, and I'd also just like to uh, say that I really appreciate. Um, your the nuance of your argument and 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 reminding all of us that it's not just about the right not to parent, but the right to parent and to do so successfully. I think that is um, incredibly important uh, to remember. Um, so thanks. You're welcome. Um, and I see a question in the chat as well. But uh, and actually, I'm going to answer your first by going to your second question. Right. Is that Please. well in a way? Uh, so well, I think historically. Reproductive justice activism and talking about rights to parent and rights to you know, rights to have children, rights to parent has been focused on things like st forced sterilization um, or thinking about the role of the state in removing children from homes. Um, there's also been the work that they have done and continue to do around thinking about what it means to try to keep families together when people are incarcerated, right? Which disproportionately people of color right, um, um, have been swept up in sort of mass incarceration, right? So there's just this range of ways. And I think um, when we're in moments of crisis, right, whether it was like 2008 economic crisis or I think early in the pandemic, right, where I think a lot of people, right, who would, you know, we're doing fine before, right, recognized, right, that when you have a system that is based pretty much on one, private employers, <laughs> providing you your basic health care, right, providing you your basic sustenance to live, um, that puts a lot of trust in the functioning of the system. <laughs> and part of what the historical experience, right, of many communities of color was that they were never afforded privacy, right? Privacy wasn't something um, they had the luxuries of, right? And certainly Griswold v. Connecticut um, and then later rulings were around the privacy argument about people's privacy with them and their own, you know, private physician. That also assumed you had ac regular access to a physician, right? It assumed that you had um, physicians who also trusted you and, and cared about sort of your reproductive hopes, um, which was sort of the court's interpretation and sort of and I understand why they made those arguments, right? But privacy isn't something that people of color generally and poor people in particular have been not been able to really trust, right, in the privacy. And part of what we're thinking about here is the difference between sort of negative rights, um, which are, you know, rights like freedom from government interference versus positive rights, right, which is what the government, you know, owes to you and what the government has to give you. And so knowing that, in both cases, right, people of color in particular, right, where people, right, just kind of, you know, not considered reproductive justice, right, that like, well, privacy barely even applies to us, right, and actually we think that the government should be doing more to help us with our flourishing, right, should be doing more, should be helping us think about how we create families in the ways that we want, not the ways that they want, right, um, so for me, that's like, it's, it's intertwined, right? The sort of privacy and the limits of privacy, right? Who really gets to have privacy uh, and the reality that for many people, even if on their day-to-day, -day, they weren't having to deal with the realities of what it means to have a government that's pretty uninvolved in the care of its people, 
uh, we've seen and we continue to see the effects, right? Of what it's not labor wise, um, particularly, you know, as people have to leave the job market, et cetera. Right? So I see it as sort of all connected. Great. Thank you. There are two questions in the chat, both excellent. Professor Luna, if you were making the argument to the U.S. Supreme Court that abortion is a human right, what would you say to them? And then the second question, uh, Rachel Kennan writes, or Raquel, pardon me, Raquel, uh, thank you so much for the lecture. I'm interested in the recent media and political attention on Black maternal and infant mortality and morbidity rates in the U.S., what are some specific ways to combat these racial disparities within the healthcare system? How does this fight fit within the larger reproductive justice movement? Yeah, well, interestingly, for both those questions, um, reproductive justice advocates have been involved in making those arguments. <laughs> so part of what you're seeing is actually the success of various reproductive justice coalitions, um, particularly for the second question. Um, because rights to have children also means like rights to stay alive while you're having children. And if you trace, as I've been doing, uh, um, uh, the various individual organizations and then coalitions involved, right, in getting these things in front of legislators and getting these things in front of um, AMA, all of that, like in getting those discussions, right, that's been people involved in reproductive justice, um, particularly Black reproductive justice advocates both at grassroots organizing level and then uh, when possible, right, academics, right, who are able to conduct research studies in conjunction with um, different reproductive justice organizations, which you see with like the Black Mamas Matter Alliance, and also um, leveraging what at the time were limited, but now much broader sort of connections to media and also leveraging the fact of social media, right, in which you can actually um, do some of that messaging to often a younger audience who then starts to ask other questions. Um, and to that first question around, um, to expand on AZ's question, um, yeah, so there's actually been, we look at some of the um, amicus briefs uh, from Dobbs and others, um, which is a friend of court briefs. There's then a couple, right, coalitions of reproductive justice organizations or reproductive justice scholars where they reference human rights. One of the challenges of that, though, and these are friend of the court briefs in relation to specific abortion cases, high profile ones, right, and trying to bring in this long history and also talk about the broader context in which people are making decisions. Human rights appears a little bit, but um, something important to understand about the U.S. Supreme Court, it operates off of its own precedent <laughs> and its own law is seen as the most important, right? So uh, international law might get referenced periodically here and there, but what's happening in international settings um, isn't particularly the priority of the Supreme Court. And some would say even what's happening domestically isn't the priority. Uh, and that has to do with you know how U.S. law evolves, right? And it's very self-referential, right? Um, so you do periodically see human rights brought in, but people working within the sort of legal discourse and get all the way up to that level do understand even those who are coming from a reproductive justice approach understand that it is still the case that there is people on the court or various legislators, when they see human rights, what they think of is out there, what they think of is, oh, you know, human rights violations happen out there in China or in the Ukraine, right? They don't happen here. And that's to be dealt with by the UN, which as we've seen, you know, there's varying <laughs> levels of support for the UN among um, uh, political elites, shall we say. So, you know, you could certainly try to make the case, but if you get to the Supreme Court, right, people are also really trying to get their case won and not get it dismissed um, outright. And they understand that it's the legal realm, human rights as applied to the US um, isn't fully recognized, which is why I still found it, you know, fascinating, right? That there was this effort, and that's probably because it was coming from a grassroots effort to say like, what do we need to try to build Right in our own spaces. 
that is above and beyond what the courts are going to be able to imagine for us. Um, okay. Our next question, Zakia, thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. um, Ariana writes, I was wondering if you could say more about the place of disability justice within the larger reproductive justice movement. How are the two connecting now and how have they been con connected historically? Mm -hmm. And then Peter writes, um, and I don't know, Peter, uh, you what if you could expand on that, that would be great um, in the chat. That would be wonderful. So Zakia, to you. Yeah. Yeah, um, and Ariana, thank you about the question um, for the question regarding disability justice. Yeah, and I think disability is also an important part of this. Um, and in my longer talks, and actually in my I teach a class on politics and reproduction, uh, when we're talking about sterilization, I, we do um, quite a bit with the Buck v. Bell case, right, which was a um, case in 1927 of Carrie Buck, um, a poor white woman in Virginia who at the time um, had been put into a um, state colony for epileptics, the language at the time, and was considered feeble-minded, right? And because she was under the care of the state, right, they, uh, and she had come in to the facility pregnant, <laughs> Um, and was therefore promiscuous because she was unmarried and her mother was deemed quote unquote feeble-minded. And after she had the child, right, the facility right, was, wanted to forcibly sterilize her, which technically under the state, right, the state has the right to do so. Um, and Justice Holmes said very famously in this case that went all the way up to the Supreme Court, right, that Carrie Buck was contesting, right, this forced sterilization. Um, that was basically being done around concerns of mental capacity because, you know, famously said three generations of imbeciles are enough, right? And this is the majority opinion, right? 1927, Buck v. Bell, right? So, and, you know, Buck lost the case, right? And multiple states at the time had forced sterilization laws, yes, around public health, but also around, um, quote unquote, criminality, also around, um, Anything that was, you know, you know, being disability, right? And while, you know, again, particularly with Nazi Germany, um, and oh, and thank you for the clarification. Um, you know, again, as I mentioned, like formally eugenics fell out of favor, right? But what it meant is that there was many states that still have on the books um for sterilization laws that as Peter Blankenheim has pointed out, and I think as your question, Ariana, is getting at, right, that do allow for sterilization as people with disabilities under the care of the state, under particular scenarios, and particularly under 18. Um, National Women's Law Center just published a study, uh, well, I guess now it's about six months ago, sort of looking at the states and the fact that it's still actually allowed um, for um, people deemed to have particular disabilities under the care of the state within like state facilities, right? Um, and so there are various um, reproductive justice advocates, right? Who have been working on even just doing basic education around this while they're also aligned with people working sort of through more sort of reproductive rights legal advocacy realms, right? Uh, because as um, Peter has mentioned in the chat, right? Like you still have this you know, reality, right? Of what's happening. Um, to people and many people are surprised to learn, right? That in certain cases, people with disabilities, right? Uh, the state is allowed to forcibly sterilize them. Um, and right, it shows that this, that's why I put like not so distant past because <laughs> there's still elements of these things on the books. Um, and that means either they could be enforced or in some places they are actually right, continually being enforced. So, disability justice advocates um, have been doing work um, as part of reproductive justice and also part of their own sort of activism, right? And it's an important space in which there's been ongoing conversations since some of the arguments that get made for, in this particularly in early reproductive rights cases, and you still see this a little bit, for why right, we need to have, you know, access to legal abortion has been around, right, while potential fetal abnormality 
and potential disability, which coming from a disability justice pers- perspective automatically presumes, right? That the problem is people with disabilities rather than the problem being a society that does not know how to actually um, accommodate people with disabilities, right? And doesn't right, seek their thriving. So there's a long history and there's continued contestation. And I think um, it's going to be one of the areas that we're going to, as some cases have shown, um, hear more and more about because of, um, as we're going state by state and people are dealing with the sort of overturning of Roe, I think there's more of a spotlight on all uh, other types of reproduction related <laughs> things that are on the books that are actually implied within all of this. Uh, and each of these agendas, um, just continuing on on that question, um, multiple of those agendas do mention disability, right? And in the book I talk about, and mind you, some of the early parts when I was collecting data, because all the way from like 2007 to, actually, I some stuff all the way up to 2017. Uh, uh, but, you know, the language around disability, I think, um, as, long, as well as um, language around gender expression has also, you know, really evolved even in reproductive justice spaces, right? And going from when I look at newsletters, you know, might see an article here and there, and you might see um, reference to things in different workshops, right? Now at different convenings, um, like the public conferences, you see like multiple sessions that are explicitly about like disability justice, right? You also see explicit sessions around um, thinking about gender expression, thinking about transgender, right? Like you see explicit sessions and sometimes not just one, like multiple, actually, right? Uh, which I think shows the growth and understanding and discussion around the connections between all of these like um, topics and, and communities really, right? Great. Thanks, Dr. Luna. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, so I'm part of the Collaborative for Reproductive Equity on campus here, and I'm, I'm really interested in um, how and if you saw in your research um, any like cross talk between advocacy and research organizations and, and what you kind of think the future is for that kind of work that, that branches across advocacy organizations and research institutions. I know there's a very fraught history obviously between those two spaces and just kind of uh in your um vision what what would you see as kind of a productive relationship between those two spaces thanks again you're welcome yeah yeah um yeah i, I think it's interesting and i and i compare it a little bit to a little bit um to what happened with the let's say evolution of the environmental justice movement right there certainly were already folks who were working in a environment and sort of mainstream environmental approach, um, Sierra Club and some others. And then you had folks saying, actually, like, it's really important we talk about race and like the disproportionate impact, right? And precautionary principles. And then you saw, you know, as there was this sort of groundwork being laid and more sort of building of relationships, then you saw like researchers being invited in, right? Or going to organizations saying, hey, I want to help when they're being that sort of trust built and sometimes trust, you know, broken. Um, but I, I think it also has to do a little bit with some of the stages of where movements are at, right? And reproductive health and reproductive rights, right? There's been research arms in the sense that there's been research, some research, government research, for example, around reproductive health, right? That advocacy organizations could rely on or um, data collection that um, the traditional legal and reproductive rights sort of approached organizations like could re- ask for support with, or they might, uh, every once in a while have their own research uh, you know, staff, which is pretty rare, right? And, you know, reproductive justice, right, even sort of started, even though activists had been involved in reproductive health and reproductive rights, as well as other movements, right? the development of this sort of reproductive justice movement. Uh, I mean, the phrase itself has only been around like 30-ish years, right? <laughs> and in that time, there's been a lot of education around like, well, how is this different from reproductive rights and reproductive health, right? And that was happening within movement sectors, right? 
And how is it, it's not that it's better than, how is it related to, how can we support each other, both with our resources, <laughs> with our numbers, right? And also what do we do when trust is broken, which kind of publicly, there's been some like public letters that came from reproductive justice leaders um, around that and their sort of dealings with organizations like Planned Parenthood, et cetera, historically. So first, I think part of it is that that's what's happening, right? But then as far as research, right, we've seen some research bodies like Society of Family Planning, which has a sort of funky name. <laughs> um, <laughs> for those in the audience who don't know, Society of Family Planning is a private membership-based organization uh, that was basically created so that um, people who were studying abortion and to some degree contraception could actually get some research funding because they, it was very difficult to get it through. <laughs> um, no matter who the president was in office, it's like very difficult to get government funding for it, right? And they wanted to basically create a base um, of scientific-based research. Um, uh, and you have to be like nominated to be a member, right? There's a whole set of things that happen. And even in my brief time being a member there, right? There's now, um, uh, you know, there's been multiple like main plenaries of these things that are about reproductive justice, inviting in advocacy, like activists, like including people from Sister Song, um, or right, inviting in local abortion funds to talk about like the grassroots work they're doing and increasing at least in my visibility, increasing numbers, right, of researchers doing work with abortion funds, whether um, in reproductive justice organizations broadly, whether or not, whether it's that they were members and they wanted to support the research or they wanted to develop, you know, they weren't members, but thought it was an important area. So I think it takes time. And in moments like this, um, and this happening to, you know, not to diminish the impact of Dobbs, right? Um, but with any of the sort of major cases where they were going through in the different stages around abortion cases, right? For a lot of folks, there's a sense of urgency. But movements are about trust and building relationship. <laughs> and it took time to get wherever folks are at. <laughs> and it takes time. Um, thank you, Abigail Ferguson. Um, takes time to develop that trust because it's for the long haul, right? Um, and yeah, so there are, I think there's increasing sort of spaces there, um, but it takes time to develop those relationships. And I, I will just note being sitting on a campus and um, um, uh, I always say this while we're still recording, um, <laughs> depending upon the broader context in which you're in, the political context, right? Whether you're you know, on campus as a state institution, a private institution, right? There's different constraints you're dealing with, right? Um, and that can have an impact. And in those times, I think it's really important to anticipate those times as much as possible and start developing relationships before they're sort of needed, right? Um, I, yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm mindful of being recorded. <laughs> um, uh, because historically around reproductive issues, right? There's been moments of crisis. And I think um, there's been folks saying that like Roe was gonna be overturned, you know, basically, you know, we had evidence from 1976, right? There was things happening and it's finally happened. There's contestation happening. There's all sorts of things happening in the States. And when people see different sort of successes on the ground, different state initiatives, um, like Kansas or something, people were like, oh, wow, they got together really quickly and did that. But no, <laughs> there's been people working together, not just months, but in some cases years on other types of issues, other types of campaigns, such that they already have the depth to actually mobilize people quickly around these issues. Um, and so I think it's possible, but I think it is about developing relationship. And that means just like basic meetings, some basic meals, like where are we coming from on this? Like before people try to like jump into like, all right, we're going to fix this policy issue that's happening at our campus. Like, okay, but do you actually know each other? Do you know what's going on in each other's lives? Do you know each other's commitments? And particularly on campuses where there's one set of folks to just by definition are there for a much short period of time, like students. <laughs> um, 
uh, even doctoral students, right, might feel like a long time from any doctoral, right, <laughs> compared to, say, staff, right, compared to researchers, compared to, and then the people in the town, right? So that, I think, is also really important, that sort of recognition and thinking about, okay, well, what can I help you with now, right? What is it that you need, you know, done now? And that gets to Myra's question, Mary's question. Um, and I think part of what some of the most urgent questions, um, luckily there's been some people, I'm uh, sorry, I, um, does, hopefully that answers, Lindsay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, there's been researchers who have been doing studies around a range of reproductive issues. And some of them, you know, for example, some of the early studies, <laughs> very quick studies that happened in the beginning of the pandemic when Texas halted abortions, um, Ofer Laser Whalen had already done some studies with some Texas-based abortion funds, right? Had already been involved with that work, had already developed those relationships just in general and had published some work around there. And, you know, was therefore able to, um, in this time of, as you know, it was major upheaval for people trying to seek abortions within Texas, um, still able to keep an eye on that sort of larger research questions and thinking about like, okay, the reality is, right, this might, you know, this might be the reality very soon for many states, right? <laughs> Not just the Texases, right? Um, and a few others, right? And that research has been able to be shared. I mean, yes, it's been published in academic it's getting published in academic journals, but also being shared among certain sets of advocates, right? To think about what do they need to keep in mind for themselves <laughs> as advocates, as well as for their patients in this time, right? And that happened because someone who was able to kind of step back and bring that social science lens, right? Already had those relationships in place. And so that work, the work on the ground that's already happening. Um, to that prior question around maternal health, um, you know, there's been increasing you know, researchers and now increasing funding, which is, I think, important as well um, around recognition, right? That you have maternal health outcomes, particularly for Black women that look as bad as what you see in many countries that don't have the supposedly robust healthcare system that we have in the US, right? And it's not just staying in academic journals though, right? It's going to the, um, you know, organizations, you know, the white coats for black lives, right? It's going to other um, coalition spaces and that sharing of information. Um, and you see things like the Black Ma Mama's Life Matter Alliance, um, where you have researchers who are part of it, as well as people coming purely from advocacy organizations, right? Saying like, what do we need? Well, we need this type of study. We need this type of study. And, and doing that, right? Um, and I think also just based on the types of questions I get, um, there's limited, very limited research happening, um, well, funded research, let's say, um, regarding um, trans communities and reproductive needs, right? And the other reality is like, that's a very diverse community, just like people with disabilities is diverse, just like, Black people are diverse, right? Um, and what the reproductive desires and needs are, aren't the same, right? It depends, right? On um, how you're coming into um, your experience of trans identification, right? What life stage, right? Where in your life course, you're coming into it, right? Um, so what does it mean to support like, people at different stages, right? In um, whether it's not having children or whether it's having children, and um, raising those children, right? And so looking at the impact of the laws and things like that. Those are some of the things um, that are we need to know, um, as well as just in general, this isn't social science specific, uh, but you know, research on the long haul. And I think, you know, for people who study movements or involved with movements, people like understand like, yeah, it's a long haul. <laughs> Um, there's lots of defeats on the way to successes, right? And the minute there's successes, often there's mobilization and opposition, right? 
And so more work that's out there that can be translated to the public that's about like, hey, yes, it's great. You want to be involved in movements and also understand like there's a short term and there's a long term. <laughs> and it's important to assess sort of where you are at um, and what you can contribute at this point, but also so that you don't burn yourself out. <laughs> because if you're really interested in trying to achieve reproductive justice, environmental justice, disability justice, right? That is a very long-term project, right? And it's important that people also be taking care of themselves. Um, and so whether that's official social science research, like <laughs> how do you get people to continue to, <laughs> to recognize that they are embodied humans <laughs> before moving into movement spaces? <laughs> um, but that would be something else that's needed. Thank you very much, Zakia. Um, the floor is open for further questions. I have a few more, I suppose. Zakia, what do you what would you say are the um, and this is going to be a very broad uh, okay. question? Uh, what are the impediments to advancing a reproductive justice that you see um, in the current moment and in the future? Definitely based on your own research. Um, and and how do people get involved in uh, promoting? Uh, or, or or being active in, in these movements that you're talking about? I mean, I think one challenge for movements, um, thank you, Myra. Thank you. It's so good to see you, Zoom wise. Um, <laughs> it's like I'm back in Madison. <laughs> um, uh, I'd say one challenge, and this happens with many movements, right, is movements move. <laughs> so you have people who've been involved for years, or in some cases, decades. Who have a lot of institutional knowledge. Uh, and then you have people who have learned about something, you know, whether they saw a flyer or a tweet or something. And sometimes like people are coming in, they have a lot of energy and I think, great. But sometimes with that energy, it right, doesn't necessarily come humbleness. And people then have a whole bunch of suggestions about what should be done. Um, in the next, you know, three weeks. <laughs> and part of what I encourage, you know, when I do my movements classes or just in general, so to think about like the fact that there's a meeting that you could go to is an indication that there's people who've already been doing this work, right? <laughs> um, the fact that there was a space organized, there was a time organized, right? So they may have been doing a little bit work around this bit longer than you have, right? And of course, ideas are welcome, but also it's important to understand a bit more of the history, like of the space that you're in. And that doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to be able to like sit there and purchase books. <laughs> but now, you know, organizations have websites. <laughs> when I first started collecting data, I, this study, I think Twitter had just launched the year prior. <laughs> um, TikTok didn't exist, right? There's so many spaces in which you can learn, and organizations themselves are putting out this information, right? Uh, and you don't have to go to a conference, right, to like sit there and learn it all. But understand it, you know, like, okay, where am I coming into this? What already seems to be happening, right? Um, and, and also sometimes, um, you know, when I mentors, Kristen Luper used to talk about the grunt work and glamour of research. And I think that's the reality of movements, right? Um, and you know, there's a couple articles out there about the sort of mundaneness of movement work. You know, one of them about the Zapatistas and like, you know, who who refills the coffee, right? <laughs> like, who sweeps the floor, right? Like that. People don't think of that as movement work, and it's not necessarily what you see on you know mainstream media, and it's not necessarily what people are posting on their social media either. But that is a reality and that work also needs to happen in movement spaces, right? It's not only the big public visible things. And so I think that means, you know, when you're going into spaces thinking about, yes, what's already happened, what might be ways that you can contribute? And then asking like, where might you need me? And the answer might be like, yeah, we have this big action coming up, but because you haven't received training yet on like de-escalation techniques, like we're not, you know, gonna have you there on the front lines, but we could really use your support in, you know, phone banking or whatever it is, right? Um, and so for me, it would be, you know, one of the big challenges is that, you know, movements get a lot of visibility, particular times and people want to jump in and say, hey, 
this is the way things should be done when you have you know, the histories of people, right? Who've been thinking about and doing this work and connecting with the people in their communities about this work. And so that's one of the challenges that comes up when there's high visibility. So like, Great, thank you very much. Yeah. Anyone else have a question for Zakia? Hello, thank you so much for this wonderful. Um, I was I was just wondering, is shifting a little bit. I was wondering if you could speak more to the work that's being done by uh, uh, reproductive justice organizations uh, to particularly in their in their uh, relationship with legislators and and getting involved in that process of shifting the way that human rights is is conceptualized really. So what what is the work that's done there? What are the um, maybe like strategic trade-offs, but also, you know, what are the, uh, what allies do they um, have in this fight, right? And this, in, in shifting this idea. Um, yeah, so curiosity. <laughs> yeah, um, and so I just want, I realized I never put in the chat, um, um, uh, I'm putting the link to um, the National Women Law, Women's Law Center, which I mentioned in um, answering questions around disability and what current laws are. And um, they've been doing quite a bit of work around this. So that link that's in there takes you to a set of campaigns and some of the amicus briefs they've been working on um, and it's sort of broadly on disability and gender, but then also um, particularly around reproductive issues if you scroll down. Um, okay. Uh, I think it was Ariana who had asked that question. Um, anyway, um, yeah, so yeah, some of the contemporary work that's happening, uh, and, and I'd say it's a continuing set of work. Um, so even at, um, you know, like the Sister Song Conference, which I was just at in August, um, there's still right, educational work that happens, right, around human rights, like, what are human rights? And from my researcher perspective, I do some work, like, kind of, like, tracking, like, okay, like, you know, which does it appear in different programs? <laughs> uh, one of the big things that I know in the book is that Sister Song in particular, um, you can look at their mission statement, it's, and it's shifted from, like, two sentences to, at times, being, like, there was one that was like eight sentences. I mean, I count it by word and then back down, uh, even when there's additions of like bodily autonomy, et cetera, like human rights remained there. And even after Loretta Ross left, because there were some folks and they talk about in the book, right? Loretta Ross certainly being a big influence, um, but not the entirety, right? Like, and that there's folks who are still committed to it, but that means continually educating, not just from outsiders, but people within your space around like, okay, how do we talk about human rights? Um, how do we, um, whether it's, you know, little booklets around the UDHR, things like that um, is part of what happens. And I'm not saying it happens at every, because I haven't been in every single, they call them, you know, every single <laughs> reproductive justice organizations, meetings and everything. I mean, like now there's, many of them. Uh, but even when I was looking at those agendas, right, um, human rights was still there, right, within, uh, it was four of the five agendas, um, it was there, right? And it might not seem big to use that language, but considering, like, folks are coming together, they're pouring over this language <laughs> for these policy agendas that goes to their you know, general membership, but also multiple of these were like, you know, given to legislators, right? The fact that it's still there, right? And they're talking about these broader rights is important. Um, and I also think things like crises, like global pandemics, right? Also highlight <laughs> for a much broader audience, the interconnections between what's happened in the US and elsewhere, right? and the connections between say, reproductive issues, labor issues, healthcare issues, right? Uh, and, and obviously in some very devastating ways, right? But in trying to use those moments 
to also, you know, where people are just a little bit more open to thinking a little bit differently. They're like, hey, maybe we can ask the government for some stuff, right? Like if they can figure out how to get people some some money <laughs> um, after they've said, basically, if you're not an essential worker, you, you can't, you know, you should not be leaving, right? Um, but if they're able to figure it out for the purposes of ensuring that people are some to be paying bills, but also like buying consumer goods to keep a consumer economy going, like, huh, maybe <laughs> like they could extend that and continue to figure that out, right? Um, and trying to use those openings Right. To be like, well, you know, this other world is possible. <laughs> this world in which the government says, all right, we're going to give folks money. But even though there's people within it who are not excited about giving broadly people money. Wow. Like, look at that moment. Look what they did. Right. Um, wow. They're able to figure out, I mean, whatever the challenges were, like vaccines, <laughs> you know, we're able to work globally to figure out vaccines. Right. Um, able to figure out distribution, able to somehow get beyond all of those insurance things right, for at least a period of time, right? And so it raises, you know, it shows people a different model that you can then try to refer to as well. And while not everybody <laughs> will see that model and be open, right? You have a bit more, right? A bit more, a bit more of that shifting, right? Yeah. Um, that's the other thing I was going to say. Uh, I happen to have some stuff here from a conference, and there was something, well, now I can't find it, that it made me think around um, some of the stuff around human rights when we're reading Texas. This is what happens when you read in someone's office. They have to be what they are called artifacts <laughs> um, right next to them. I will say one other thing. I mean, you can also look at the U.S. Human Rights Network, which um, is a coalition of different organizations, a lot of them working around racial justice, um, that are like trying to, you know, develop a U.S. a broad-based U.S. human rights movement. I uh, kept my eye on them. This isn't official, like that table was, but like, there's been more attention to gender, like, in general, <laughs> a little bit more around reproductive issues. And even in those spaces, right, like seeing organizations make statements that otherwise wouldn't that talk about like, hey, this is a human rights issue. That also shows a shifting, I think, uh, in part, because also oftentimes it was only the opposition who was talking about human rights and abortion in a very particular way, which I also talk about a little bit in the book. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of exciting things. And it'll be interesting to see with the MacArthur grant. I mean, I'm not joking. Like Loretta Ross having just gotten the MacArthur grant. Um, you know, there's a set of people are gonna be like, oh, reproductive justice and human rights. Oh, interesting. Right. People who wouldn't have who aren't sitting there trying to like you know, Google things for classes, right? Like who might be paying attention to that who are like, oh, there's this thing that's been going on. Right. And so yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Well, I think we're all um, in broad support of human flourishing here at the Havens yes. Wright Center for Social Justice. Yeah. So on, the beha on behalf of the center, I'd like to thank Professor Zakia Luna of Washington University in St. Louis for a wonderful presentation and a discussion. Thank you so much for your time, Professor Luna, but also to everyone who joined us today. Um, until next time, please be well. Thank you. Bye.